Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tim Richards, Technical Services Manager at the Managing General Agents Association. And on behalf of the MGAA, I'd like to welcome you to our briefing this afternoon. This is being delivered by Charles Taylor on the subject of green is not always clean and you still need to mind the gap. Before I introduce our presenter, I'd like to run through a few housekeeping points with you. Please ensure your microphone and camera are turned off. If you'd like to ask a question, feel free to use the chat button at the bottom of your screen. Time allowing, these questions will be asked and answered at the end of the event. If we run out of time, questions will be answered post-event. This session does include a poll, which is anonymous. The presentation is accredited for CPD hours, if relevant to your ongoing professional development programme. The briefing is being recorded and a link to the recording will be issued post event together with the slides and our feedback survey. Please take the time to complete the survey, which will take no longer than two minutes. And that uh, does continue to allow us to deliver the best possible future events to our membership. So as a recap, today's briefing is on the subject of green is not always clean and you still need to mind the gap from Charles Taylor. So let me introduce you to our presenter. Graham P. Hawkins, Associate Director and Head of Environmental at Charles Taylor. Since 2010, almost exclusively, Graham has handled environmental claims with instructions and nominations from specialist Lloyd Syndicates, Composite Insurers and MGAs. He also has experience of handling international product liability claims. Graham is a respected specialist, often nominated by specialist environmental insurers and underwriters, and many of the claim instructions he deals with relate to incidents across the globe. He coordinates with global colleagues to manage in-country claims, providing support and technical guidance regarding policy cover and interpretation. So without further ado, enjoy the briefing, everyone. And uh, Graham, if I can pass across to you. Yeah, lovely. Well, thank you very much and uh, welcome, everybody, for, uh, for joining me. Um, and I suppose probably we'll probably skip on a couple of slides, actually, uh, Tim, if that's uh, if that's okay with you. Yeah. So these are some of the learning objectives that we'll go through, which is basically just to summarise that even though we've got lots of green and renewable industries, there are still risks to the environment from the operations of these uh, of these companies, and then we're going to look at the bog standard basically gaps in cover that uh, that I used to do back in uh, back in 2010 when I first started specializing in in dealing with environmental claims and then to help people get better understanding of the specialist covers that are provided by environmental insurance I've got some claims examples at the end and there'll be a poll in there as well just to see if everybody's been uh, everybody's been listening so but yes the next slide So uh, Tim has very kindly run through my my details, but uh, that's me. Um, so we can skip on for that to the next one, and we'll start with the uh, with with the details. So as Tim says there should be time at the end for Q and A. So we'll run through uh, we'll run through that. Now we'll uh, we'll jump straight uh, jump straight in. Next slide. Thank you. So with the drive to uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions and assist in trying to stem and reduce the impact of global warming. We're still seeing a lot of wind farms, solar farms, biogas generation, biofuel refineries are coming into play and they're needing to be constructed. Now, as with a lot of um, construction projects, there are environmental risks associated with these. And what we find is that they're often the likes of wind farms and solar farms, they need to be in the countryside. The wind farms certainly need to be in locations where they can benefit from a lot of wind being present. And they're, they're, they run risks of causing quite a significant damage to biodiversity in the areas where they are being constructed. And that needs to be factored into any, um, any construction project when they're, uh, when they're looking at that. Both the uh, both the solar farms and wind farms, the and and biogas generation, there are the associated costs and the implications of connecting this power generation to the grid. Uh, the higher voltage cables are quite often oil cooled to uh, to en ensure that they can actually handle that kind of voltage. 
So once they've once they've built the uh, the projects, you've then got the operating risks. Now some of them are similar across all of them. They like any um, industry. There's the risks of fire, and they need to try and make sure that they look at how they deal with extinguishment water as well. Runoff containment is crucial not only during the construction phase but also during uh, and during the operation phase if there's any incident. So they need to make sure that fire water runoff from the fire brigade turning up isn't running off and polluting the environment. And biogas energy generation has, has its own particular risks as well. And there have been some recent episodes of uh, lightning strikes as well, causing explosions. There can be containment failures of the tanks where the, uh, the biological soup is present and also They've been that from that can re, that release of the biological soup can result in the release of the odors that can affect neighboring uh, neighboring residences. And that can all be be that. Right, next slide, thank you. So then we've got some other net zero fuels. Now these are fuels that that are renewable. So they don't, uh, they're not produced from a traditional fossil fuel uh, extraction. They're quite often deemed to be net zero. And that is on the basis that the carbon that the crops absorb whilst they're growing actually offsets the carbon that is released when the fuel is used by whatever industry is in place. So of sustainable aviation fuel is being used to fuel transatlantic flights. Virgin Atlantic uh, completed its first flight across across the Atlantic using this uh, this av sustainable aviation fuel. It's also being used by the Royal Air Force, and other kinds of biodiesel are being used in the uh, for the transportation and for agricultural machines. Now, part of the reason for this is that not only does it mean that there'll be less of a, a need to change some of the uh, some of the actual um, engines that are in the uh, in these equipment, but when you're looking at the size of batteries that are needed to power an all electric truck then just the actual power that the electric motors need to generate to make the uh, path, make the, the truck move before you even start loading it are quite significant. So that's why if they can get a sustainable and renewable source of biodiesel, then that would remove that, uh, that additional wear, on, wear and tear on the, um, on the vehicles. A lot of refineries now are changing from refining fossil fuel oils to refining renewable oils and moving on from that. But you've still got very similar pollution risks surrounding the storage and all of those sites need to make sure that they've got together and got their spill containment plan organised so that they're not just releasing all, all of this um all of this fuel into the environment if they have a an issue with one of their uh, one of their storage containers what we do find is that where there have been um releases of the uh, of these fuels then they're at because of their chemical makeup they actually produce and um, cause more of a problem with the way that they would mix with the environment, particularly with water. There are, com as I say, there are complex chemical structure and it can make, make it harder and longer and therefore more expensive for it to be, uh, for the cleanup to be completed and remediated correctly. So you've still got sites being, needing to take care of being, being vulnerable to fuel thefts. Next slide. 
And then we've got the use of electric vehicles. Yes, the electric vehicles don't produce the carbon dioxide from when they're uh, when they're being driven. But there is various um, issues that they do actually um, cause a higher incidence of wear and tear on the actual roads because the vehicles are generally heavier because of the batteries that they have to carry. Now, the batteries themselves, lithium ion batteries is the uh, one of the main uh, the main the main chemicals that are used in these uh, items. You've got the risks associated with actually mining these raw materials, which will still produce the risk of environmental damage. You've also got the manufacturing plants for the batteries. And uh, those even there was going to be a large, large scale battery factory constructed in the southwest of England. But there are still going to be associated risks with that and also the need for ensuring that the electricity grid network can actually cope with the, the power generation needs. We're already seeing signs of um, the, the government needing to open more gas powered power stations to ensure that the that the lights stay on. And even at the end of their life, there it then goes down to how they can look to repair and dispose of the uh, of the batteries and the the electric vehicles. So the it's good on the one hand, but there are other uh, other problems as well that uh, deal with it. Quite often what we what we can what we come across is it's not just on um, electric vehicles, but also on, on small items such as uh, disposable vapes. They have lithium ion batteries in them, or smaller portable items. And if some of those don't get disposed of correctly, so they make their way into the incorrect waste stream, and they're damaged, then those batteries can be a real source of. Um, fire within the waste recycling sector, as if that poor sector wasn't uh, higher risk in, uh, enough. I certainly um, needed to review how I disposed of, uh, of batteries when I've seen the uh, when I've seen the the after effects of of that. And now we'll move on to the second part of my uh, of my talk. So, so what we're going to do is, I, I first started handling environmental claims back in 2010. And at that time, many of the claims were just under either a property policy and or and on, under a public liability policy or under a motor policy as well. And that was uh, when that was in place. More often, it was to identify when the policy covers were not able to help the policyholder. And that was looking at you know, applying the correct terms of the policy and also looking at, at the, the risks that can pose that can be posed to the broking community from this uh, from this problem. So the insurance market responded to that and also to the European Environmental Liability Directive. And this started to create environmental uh, insurance products that will either on either standalone or as bespoke sections of cover within uh, within commercial combined policies and farming policies is a very uh, is a very popular one with the uh, with the risks that they have. So what we'll do now is we'll look at the basic background. So next slide, please. So it can be I've quite often done day long courses on this. So you'll have to bear with me if uh, if you you feel I'm glossing over it. And that's probably because I am. But we'll cover the very uh, the very basics. So. The um, Institute of Underwriting, the International Underwriting Association, Non-Marine Environmental Committee have produced an excellent and informative uh, guides 
on the on the actual differences and the gaps in cover have been involved in supporting them in the preparation of these uh, for uh, over the years. But looking at property cover, so the property cover covers the buildings as defined in the policy. It covers damage to those buildings by a defined peril or on an all risk basis, but it's still got to be damage to the buildings. What the property policy would not cover is the land and if there's any on-site biodiversity that's uh, that's in these in in these areas. So those are some gap, those are some elements that the property policy is not designed to cover. It's there to cover the policyholders' insurable risks in the tangible property. And then when we look at the, the liability, the public general liability policy and under motor liability, those are there to look at and indemnify the, the legal liability for damage to third party property or injury. Now, with pollution claims and environmental losses, what we find is that the, the regulators who are involved with this, such as the Environment Agency in, in England, Natural Resources Wales in Wales, and Scottish Environmental and Protection Agency, SEPA in Scotland, are the parties who take a lot of interest in these incidents when they're reported, and they want to make sure that they can prove, satisfy themselves that appropriate cleanup steps are being taken and if they're not being taken, they will undertake their cleanup works and charge the party who they believe is the polluter under what's termed the polluter pays. Public liability policy is only there to look at legal liability for damages. And the case of Bath Line gave guidance that regulatory costs are not damages and therefore should not be indemnified under a public liability policy. There's also, even if there are extensions to cover, exclusions to biodiversity impact, getting back to the main crux of the policy is it needs to be a situation where the policyholder is legally liable for the damage. If damage has been caused by the actions of an unknown third party, arguably they are not legally liable for any pollution arising from that event. And extensions to the cover will only trigger once the policy liability, the public liability cover has triggered. It also will only respond once there's actually been third party damage. So there's no emergency or mitigation costs. It would be expected that a policyholder takes reasonable steps to respond to any incident that has occurred and to also prevent damage at their own expense. So learn, going about that, what we'll do is we'll look at a claim scenario, and then we'll look at giving you some options and we'll get your um, guidance on on your your response to the poll that we're going to be uh, that we're going to be running here. So it's a fairly basic example just to, to give some kind of uh, interim basis of it. But what we've got is we've got a fire at an industrial site. This fire was started when thieves broke into the site and they were stealing fuel, were disturbed, they left the tanks open, left the, the pipes open, and there was not only the fuel that spread across site, but they also decided to cover their tracks. They'd set fire to the building. So we've got two um, or three, sorry, options here. We've got under this idea, we've got the fact that the fire brigade arrive and they, they deal with the fire damage to the buildings by turning up and applying 
lots and lots of water onto this property. The site has to cope with the fact that it's becoming washed away with all of this fire water, and that's run off site into a nearby river. So the insured as the owner of the fuel notified the local regulator, and they decided that because it was the insured's fuel, that they were they would demand that the cleanup of the site and the water course is the responsibility of the insured, even though it was caused by uh, third party thieves. So, so, and also seeing that some off site pollution may occur, then there's drainage interceptors on the site. And those drain interceptors would be over, overwhelmed by the amount of fire, amount of extinguishment water used. But the idea was that that would be pumped out over a period of hours to prevent further off site spread. So now we're going to look at some options for you. Next slide, please. So for this scenario, what we're going to look at is it's fairly basic cover. So you've got a property policy and you've got a public liability policy only providing sudden and accidental pollution cover. No extensions to it, nothing, nothing fancy, no bells and whistles on, the, on this. It's fairly, it's a very, very stripped back cover. Really. So these are the only two policies that the policyholder has. So your options are, so you've got A, property, uh, the property will cover the fire damage, loss of fuel and debris removal, which is the property policy. And then the public liability, because the insured are not legally liable, then any PL cover for third party damage only to defend the policy holder from third party claims. There would not be any cover for regulators costs and there'd be no mitigation or emergency prevention cost cover. Or option B, property policy covers all own building damage and own site cleanup, and the PL public liability response to the regulator's costs and on and off site pollution are all paid. And then finally, option C is the property policy covers all the fire damage and debris removal only. The public liability policy, because this was a sudden pollution incident, provides cover for cleanup of the water course and to also prevent pollution. So what we've got is we've got three options there looking at that scenario. So if we can bring up the, the poll, we can then uh, look at you selecting uh, A, B or C. I'll run through what my thoughts are and how I would have would have applied these as far as all of the three options are concerned. So the actual uh, answer is that it would be item A. So the property policy would cover the fire damage, the loss of fuel and debris removal. The PL cover, because the insured are not legally liable, then it would only provide cover for defending any third party damage claims. The regulator's costs are not damages that the policy can respond to. So that would not, that wouldn't be covered. And neither could the public liability policy provide any cover for mitigation or emergency prevention costs. Anybody who may have selected uh, option B, where the property covers all own buildings damage and own site cleanup, and the PL regulators' costs and on and on site and off site pollution are all paid, that's extremely generous uh, as far as the policy cover interpretation goes. Um, way beyond the risks that the policy should cover, and would certainly. Um, result in uh, some poor loss ratios for the insurers concerned because they haven't received enough premium to cover these additional costs based on that based on that type of underwriting and then we've got option c 
where the property policy covers all fire damage and debris removal only. Public liability is a sudden pollution event, so they cover all the clean of the water course and to prevent any pollution as well. So part, part you know, option C is part right and part wrong. Um, so whilst there is sudden pollution, the policy only triggers when legal liability attaches and only when they are when there is a legal liability to pay damages. So any extras on the public liability policy, which is the way that some insurers have tried to deal with this, are only activated once that policy triggers. So next slide, please. So for the same scenario, but where the broker has identified all businesses have an environmental exposure, and so they presented and ensured that there is premises pollution liability cover in place. Now, these are termed various different things across the market. Some of them are in environmental risk insurance, just environmental impairment liability insurance. What they can do is the way that the environmental policy would work in this case is that the, the property policy would continue to provide cover for the fire damage to the property as defined in the policy. It would also deal with debris removal of the building after the fire has been extinguished. Now, the premises pollution liability cover responds to pollution occurring at and migrating from the insured site. It also responds to any demands from the regulator regarding environmental cleanup. It looks at funding the costs of cleaning up the pollution, and it doesn't distinguish between whether it is on site or off site. So that's another huge benefit really is that it doesn't it doesn't need to cross the boundary before the policy starts to trigger. It also has the benefit of covering mitigation costs or emergency prevention costs, which in this case would apply to being able to incur getting back tankers in to empty the drainage interceptor and which would stop that drainage interceptor from overflowing and allowing the fire water with the chemicals involved in that to run off site. So that that's would ordinarily take place and there was there would quite often be a what they call a time excess that would apply to emergency mitigation costs. But again, even before any damage has been caused, then that's what that will cover. And then the policy also looks at reinstating and remediating any impacted biodiversity that's, uh, that's in and around the site. Flora and fauna and anything that, that, that is environmentally sensitive. And again, this is something that applies on or off site, there isn't any, the boundary doesn't, uh, doesn't apply. Slide, please. So what I've got here is, is some practical case examples for, uh, for that. So we'll run through some of these, which a lot of insurers find extremely useful where they um when they're looking at trying to discuss with brokers as to what kind of environmental risk policyholders have and over the times since i've been working in the in this market myself and my colleagues across the across the globe have dealt with a variety of different uh, different claims so this is just some of the the ones now, cross-country transportation pipelines are 
and have been a source of significant environmental claims for for myself and my my colleagues even with the uh, relatively short time i've been with charles taylor it's clear that you know, we've still managed claims in the uk in eastern europe in canada in the usa all to do with transportation pipelines which are large pipelines that pump fuel produced water or other chemicals from the um from the site to the to the producing uh, terminal and that can then what happens though is that when these pipelines are located they become a target for illegal tapping which is where thieves come along and try and drill into these high high pressure pipelines and they try and siphon off uh, the fuel that's being transported now either be a, a one-off incident that, that they try and collect and um, carry away a significant volume of fuel. Or my colleagues have even had cases where the pipeline has been tapped and the di the fuel has part some of the fuel has been diverted across quite a large area to effectively to an illegal fuel station. That, uh, that the local uh, that the local criminals were using, but if that uh, if that pipeline isn't maintained properly, or they have any suspicion that the police and authorities may be looking to uh, to get them, then they would would have quite often look to cut their losses and run, and they're not obvious. They're not obviously uh, too concerned about how. Uh, how safe and environmentally conscious they are when they leave the site. Then another source of environmental claim is actually, you know, milk, milk tankers. It's it's quite usual when I discuss various scenarios with um, brokers and policyholders, and those in the uh, particularly in the retail sector, to for them to actually appreciate. The, the risks to the environment when things like a milk tanker rolls over and drops its load of milk across the road, which may get, then get washed off the road and into roadside drains, but it will likely also get into the, uh, into the river. And the problem with milk is that because it's an organic, uh, organic product, it actually absorbs the oxygen from the water so it's extremely uh, dangerous for to aquatic life, unlike an oil spill where the oil would float on the river surface. The milk mixes with the water and absorbs absorbs the uh, oxygen, which then suffocates the uh, the poor old fish and uh, there. So that makes it quite uh, quite difficult to um, to deal with to remediate and. It needs the reoxygenation of the uh, of the river as well, which is why you quite often get quite expensive remediation costs because it's not a straightforward uh, straightforward matter. Now another um, somewhat unusual one that, that I've been involved with was where you've got um, mold that grows in buildings. Yeah, there are Quite a lot of this occurs across um, tropical climates where air conditioning, air conditioning in the buildings would ordinarily keep any mold growth well contained. But if there are if they're subject to hurricanes, cyclones, tropical storms, the buildings can be subjected to flooding from arising from that. And also there can be the problems when the um, the power to the air conditioning units goes. So even if you have buildings that do not actually suffer any tangible flood damage, then you used to have the risk that because they haven't got any air conditioning, 
filtering the air in the buildings. Because of the, the climate, it's perfect for mold growth to take place and that can pose real risk to human health and human habitation. So that then needed to be uh, to be dealt with. And then the environmental insurance policy that the um, university had in place was able to respond to that in addition to the property policy that looked at the actual flood damage. And then we've got another uh, another school. So you'll, you'll be seeing that not many of these uh, examples are what you would term high you know, heavy industry, uh, but they've still produced large and ex large and expensive uh, environmental claims. So we have a private school who chooses to replace their boiler and their fuel tanks. But for whatever reason, probably on cost, they don't choose to replace the fuel lines which connect those two. So they continue to use their new boilers, but still think they're seeing a uh, higher than normal fuel usage. Further investigations show that the actual fuel supply lines have got uh, have got rusted and they've got little holes within them pinholes that has allowed the uh, allowed the fuel to escape into the ground and that's been taking place over a significant period of time so any public liability policy would not cover that because it's been a gradual a gradual release it's within a source protection zone, so the environment agency in this case were wanting and demanding that steps should be taken to protect the drinking water aquifer. Quite often we come across situations where drinking water boreholes are in place, but because of other pollution incidents, these boreholes are out of action. So when you get down to only having one or two boreholes that can be used to safely extract drinking water from an aquifer, then the environment agency are extremely keen to make sure that uh, these matters are dealt with uh, dealt with properly. And then with another such incident is um, an accidental fire at a waste processing. Uh, waste processing site. Um, yeah, over the hot summers that, that came to be happened quite commonplace for uh, fire for fires at waste recycling sites. This was a, a modern site which had drainage and a containment pond. And they were also able to make sure that there was no off-site uh, spread of the fire water because this containment pond was catching the uh, and all the items, all the liquid that was going into the drains, and what they had to do is they had to incur back tankers to go back and forth, emptying some of the uh, some of the, the the liquid from the uh, containment pond, and that would prevent any environmental spreading off site. So that's that's where the emergency containment response was able to support the policyholder in that respect. And finally, another um, unusual one is, is, is on, a, uh, on an agricultural plane. Um, so farming policies, farming insurers are uh, quite often uh, aware of the increased environmental risks that, that a lot that face a lot of farmers. But this particular uh, farmer had um, agreed with a, a local waste uh, company to accept some ha aggregate onto their uh, onto their property which they which they expected to be purely inert. It turned out that the um, the waste company were already under investigation by the EA and they'd actually supplied this waste containing asbestos, parts of asbestos. So the Environment Agency demanded that the farmer 
ensure that the asbestos was removed from their property and without the benefit of an environmental liability cover the farmer would have been would have had to just um, file for bankruptcy but because he'd got the insurance cover then that was there to uh, to sort out um, the, the costs involved in having to pay for, for workers to come and actually pick the larger pieces of asbestos from this aggregate and the rest was able to be uh, to be filtered. But that still produced a significant uh, a significant cost. Okay, and then next slide, please. So hopefully we've uh, we've met the, the learning objectives. So summarized how environmental risks are still present with green industries. So, okay, well, that's fairly evident that other people wouldn't perhaps appreciate that even you know, green green industries that are supposed to be good for the environment can pose problems to the environment if things go wrong. And then we looked at where the gaps are, are in cover are between property and general liability cover. Even if they've got barter line extensions, the need for them to still have uh, needing to have a legal liability. And then we've got specific benefits that are provided by environmental insurance, particularly emergency response costs, the way that the policy provides for on and off-site remediation, so it doesn't distinguish between what is the insured site and what is not their site. And it extends to cover any impact to uh, to delicate bi biodiversity as well. No conclusion. So we're now at questions and hopefully answers if the questions aren't too uh, aren't too technical for me. Thank you very much, Graham. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't have any Q and A's in the chat at the moment. So anyone, if they want to come off mute, do feel free to come off mute and uh, ask your question, your question live to Graham now, or alternatively, uh, type it in the chat. And uh, I'll keep it anonymous if you wish, and uh, I'll put that to Graham too. Um, in the meantime, Graham, uh, just while we're waiting, uh, I don't know if you've got, uh, say, one or two key te key takeaways that you hope um, attendees will have uh, gleaned from your market briefing. I think I think the main thing to for for every well, everybody who they're who they're talking about is that not to just believe that. It's only heavy industry who have an environmental risk. And um, basically any any business has an environmental risk, even if something like you know, dry cleaners, or I've dealt with environmental claims involving fast food takeaways where they've spilt their um they've spilt their oil from their weight, their waste oil has gone off somewhere. Um, so on that side of things, so th there is always an environmental risk, and there there are more insurers now are also looking to apply the cover under their property and public liability policies in a much stricter interpretation because there is cover that can be put in place to protect the policyholder. Thanks, Graham. I do have one question, which has just come in on the chat. Uh, what is the best way for a business to check how comprehensive their insurance is? Um, have a check, have a read of your policy. It sounds like, I know it's something, sometimes something that some businesses don't, uh, don't often look at until it comes to be the time of the play. But if you've got a comprehensive, if you've got a, um, a combined policy, you need to probably look at and see whether or not there is an environmental liability section of cover. Additions to the public liability cover to reflect environmental uh, environmental cover. 
if you don't see any of that, then you need to probably have a chat with uh, with your insurance broker to determine if if they've got if there's any other options that they're able to provide to the to that particular policy holder. So it's, uh, it's quite. I'm afraid it's the old adage of you need to read your policy to find out what you're covered for. Um, but that's pretty much what I spend a lot of my time doing is reading the policies and uh, from that. Thanks very much. And uh, another question we've just uh, had in literally just this second: How regularly do you find claims have to be turned down, at least in part, as the existing cover is not? is not triggered less so now um mainly because well it's, it's two things really one one thing is is if you if you've paid for and only taken out your insurance cover on price then there will be a reason why your premium is not as high as it has been and that will be probably because it does not provide you with as comprehensive level of cover as you can get. Same with any any insurance, I have it with my own car insurance as well, is that you can't just price on premium price. So you need to make sure that you look beyond that and actually see what you get for your for your cover. Um, than than not but most of the claims that I used to deal with when I was uh, when I was starting out there were a lot more public just public liability claims that involved pollution so we could only cover part of the loss um, that, where there was third party damage and then it was a matter of whether the policy whether the insurer looked was that but a lot of the other, I mean, even special M, certain MGAs as well have looked to provide insurance cover that gives a separate section of cover for environmental liability insurance, and that's where it can be can be quite uh, useful and helpful to give that. Where they've got that cover, then the insurers are happy to progress with claims under those sections because that's what they've collected the premium for. And uh, okay. next question. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. Did you finish, Frank? Sorry. So, um, is environmental insurance now advisable in the domestic setting? Well, um, it depends on the wording of your policy. Um, a lot of domestic insurers have um, wide wordings so they're quite generous in the wordings um, so the ones have it where they just provide cover for any legal liability of the policy holder in which case that is considered to extend to include environmental cover the environmental liability that the regulator imposes but other policies are quite strict as to they only cover legal liability for damages. So that's why we, we are seeing that quite a lot of, predominantly in the high net worth and also in the, um, in the farming uh, community, in the rural areas, rural, rural um, policies do look to deal with those, those facts. And because the, the houses in those locations are quite often away from the gas network, so they need to have an alternative means of providing um, heating, and fuel oil is one of those. And I don't think that's going to necessarily change because they're looking at producing renewable, sustainable fuel oil for domestic heating. So whilst they're not having to um, drill for the uh, drill for the oil, it will still be grown and processed and refined, and it will still pose the same risks to the environment. More so, if if anything happens with their uh, with their with their tanks. And the last question for the time being: 
Do current environmental policies have a cyber exclusion? If so, where will the cyber, cyber market cover the loss caused by a cyber breach? Uh, quite, a, quite a few of the bespoke policies that I look at actually do provide some cyber cover. So they, they have the underwriters there have been alive to the, the, the problems that could be posed. So if you've got, um, for example, if, if you're a, a wastewater treatment works and your computer system is hacked, you could have you could be faced with an environmental claim if the hacker decides that they're going to open all the valves and release the uh, the waste that you have in your care to into the environment. So there are there are potentials for that cover to be in place. So there is there is extra extra elements that the underwriters are looking to provide as well. Thanks, Graham. And that was the last question. Um, so I'll just uh, leave it on that slide, uh, which uh, Graham has your contact details there. Yeah. If uh, anyone wants to get in contact, so it just remains for me to say thanks so much, Graham, for your session today, which I'm sure everyone will agree has been very engaging. As you'll have seen, as I've already said, you can reach Graham at uh, graham.hawkins at charlestaylor.com, which is on your screen now, or do feel free to contact me at tim.richards at mgaa. .co.uk with any questions or introductions and I'll be happy to pass these on. Thanks also to all of you for joining us. Please don't forget to provide your feedback which uh, we'll follow in an email soon asking for that uh, along with the link to the slides and the recording. Uh, do also look out for forthcoming MGAA events. We have one tomorrow in fact. So I do hope you have a productive afternoon. Thanks again for joining us and see you all soon.